in there. Yeah. So you just carry the shoe. So that's basically what it is. Now, when people think of is incest, you know, they say, oh, I know what incest is. That's when you do it with your mother or your father. Yes, those are two of them. Or you do it with your son or your daughter. Yes. Or you do it with your sister. Not your, or if, if you're, yeah, you do, if a guy does it with his sister, you know. So in all of those situations, the two parties are uh, guilty of the death penalty. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Then there's also uh, grandparents, and that comes. That's important because Morgan Freeman. Yes, yeah, how many people these days are having <laughs> sex with, with their grandparents, and it's just not right. I never even you thought. You gotta of... overcome that temptation. Right, Morgan Friedman. It, 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 scuttle is that he did it with his uh, um, step grand stepdaughter. Grand, no, no, I can't even say it. Yeah. If you want to look this up on Google, folks, just put in forbidden sexual. Relationships, Yom Kippur. And what do you got? You got all 18? Read them out. Well, I haven't quite got I'm going to watch the end of the game here. You, you read I haven't all... quite got them yet. You suppose, You just told everybody that you'd have them. I, I, I'm typing it into my smartphone. I can't, I can't do it as quickly as I... Okay, forbidden sex. Well, the first entry, forbidden sexual relationships. It's from my blog. Bigfoot.net, forbidden sex. Oh, okay. Uh, well, what kind of world is it when people looking for Torah information end up on Lukeford.net? It's bad, bad thing. Ginger said something very smart, and I, and I actually agree with her. She said someone argued an article recently because of gay marriage that pretty soon incestuous marriages are next. And I would say they should be. Because once, who, who is the gov if the government, you know, is allowing two men to be married, you know, when that's, when that's, mm -hmm. that's, according to the Torah, that's an abomination uh, that deserves the most uh, severe form of the death penalty, then, then what's the, why can't, uh, what was her name, Angelina Jolie and her brother get married? You know, mm -hmm. What's, what's, wh why? Why are they allowed to and they're not? They're more, in, they're, you could argue that they're more, uh, 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 closer to an, a, a standard marriage because at least it's a man and a woman, right? Even though it's just, it's also a uh, uh, death penalty. But yeah, and, and my thing is, what about polygamy? You know, if, how can you, how, it's hypocritical to allow gay marriage, but you're not going to allow polygamy. Because some of us have a fantasy about being with two women or what? Well, what's wrong with polygamy? You know, there's many cultures that still allow it. So what, why, why is that one, you know, where's the, uh, the, the, the equal... Clause. What's it called? The clause. Equal protection clause. Equal protection. What? What about them? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so Rashi writes that it, that we read this on Yom Kippur to remind anyone who's committed these common sins they are forbidden and to lead them to repent. Tosafos explains that we read this passage because women dress up in their best clothes on Yom Kippur and men need to be reminded to keep their desires under control. Okay, relations. These relations are forbidden, and we need to remember that and heed the warning. Steve Greenberg, the gay Orthodox rabbi, has a different take on this. He says that, first of all, it's better to read the passage than to deny that it exists. Second, reading Leviticus 18.22 in Shul on Yom Kippur makes gay people present in a powerful, if challenging, way. The reading can become a call to greater empathy and understanding. We can use it to bring communal memory the countless people throughout the ages who on the most holy day of the year had no voice in the face the most devastating misrepresentation of their hearts. And it can serve as an impetus for learning and reinterpretation of the biblical and rabbinic texts that should no longer be a source of self-loathing or exclusion. This is an incredibly self-serving distortion of the Jewish tradition. Should adulterers and those guilty of incest also take the opportunity as an impetus for learning and reinterpretation of the biblical and rabbinic texts? This is similar to using the Torah reading of Pasha Zahor, which teaches us to destroy the memory of Amalek as a way of embracing Amalek, or of blowing the shofar as a way of leading us all to sin, or lighting the menorah as a way of stimulating assimilation and abandonment of Jewish heritage. But I wanted to talk about some of my Yom Kippur memories. You were supposed to read off the 18... I can't find them. Oh, God, that was the only thing we're supposed to do, not bore us by reading somebody else's thing word for word. 
So, so the first time. Okay, I, what is it? What is it? It's Leviticus what eighteen twenty two. Yeah. So the first time I was in a conservative shul. I think the second time ever that I was in a synagogue. The services was for Rosh Hashanah services. Um, I would have Shalom Conservative Synagogue in Orlando, Florida. It was so boring. And he's back. He's back. He's out the wall. And he brings in the catch. Okay, one out to go. One out to go. Um, so okay, I've got it right here. There on Rosh Hashanah, and it just went on and on and on. I thought, what did I convert to? Okay, here it is. You ready? Yeah. All right. Uh, Okay, it's 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 eighteen twenty two, right? Yeah. Vs zacher lo tzishkav mishkave isha that a male should not lay down in the way of a, of a woman, right? He should not have a uh, male sex with a man. He shouldn't uh, put it in another man's behind. To wave a he. It's considered an abomination. Uvachal behema lo siten shech Matamava and and every kind of animal you shouldn't uh, have uh, bestiality with, uh, and the same thing for a woman. and leave me behema lariva. A woman shouldn't take it with a donkey, like you know. I saw some videos of that on the internet. Okay. It's pretty disturbing. <laughs> All right, then. I kept thinking, hadn't these women read this Torah passage? I don't think they were in shul on that day. Yeah. Where's all the. Uh, those are the only two that, that isn't the list of the 18, that just talks yes. about those two. So anyway, like yeah. Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah are pretty hard for me to get through and shul until I realized I could bring books and I could read books during the long, boring hours of prayers. I could just read some stimulating Jewish book instead. And that's such an easier way to get through the long... Also, I realized it's a great time to socialize and meet people. And often women are looking their best. Some look, ladies are looking fine on Yom Kippur. Like if you go to a non-Orthodox synagogue, they dress to their finest clothes on Yom Kippur. And they also dress like sluts a lot of the time. Like you go to like a Reform temple on Yom Kippur. I mean, some of those ladies are presenting. I mean, they are showing it. And uh, like I met girls on Yom Kippur and it's a beautiful thing. So it's a great time to socialize. More Jews are in shul on that day than any other day. So it's a great time to meet your, your beloved. And it's a great time to just like check out the scenery and see what people are wearing. And it can be really spiritual. And oh, there are always cool um, break the fast parties. And what we don't have anymore, they used to have Yom Kippur balls, where secular Jews would throw big parties on air of Yom Kippur. And they'd like eat bacon and they'd, they'd have like a young Kippur queen, they'd elect a woman to be the queen of the ball on Yom Kippur. I don't do that anymore. I kind of miss those days. <laughs> well, not that I was present for them, but I've read about them. But they were big in like the 50s and 60s, so it's a real shame. That... Right. Okay, I just want to get back to here for a second, because you're saying a couple smart things. First of all, Hector's in there. Big shout out. Hey, Hector, how's it going? Glad. Better late than never. Hey, way to show up at 8.45. You know, if, normally we're done by now. Um, he said that he recycles... Uh, and to protect, to hold on to our, our, our natural resources. Resources. That's a third reason for recycling. So let's discuss. One is because you're protecting the environment. Because <gasps> we're going to destroy the world. The second one is because you can take stuff to the, uh, to the recycling center and make money. I get that. And the third one is because we don't have enough of the, of the resource, so let's keep uh, recycling it because we need this resource. I don't have a problem with, with the second and third ones. If, if there's a resource that we don't have, and you want to keep it recycled because we don't have enough of it, I don't have a problem with that, you know, because, like, we don't want to run out of... Like, if there was a way to recycle gas, we wouldn't have to be dependent on, you know, uh, getting oil from, from Arab countries, right? If we could just make our own, you know, take a gas and then just figure out how to recycle it in the engine, hey, I, I'm all for that, right? My only problem is when people recycle because they're afraid to damage the universe because of... If we, we don't recycle it, it it's going to be gone. You know, the ozone is going to be gone. We're not going to be able to breathe. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's going to be whole climate warming and global change and all this stuff and histrionics and knee-jerk reactions. <gasps> ah, pandemonium. Okay, those are the things that, you know, I just can't tolerate because it basically says that's, an, that's, that's a philosophy 
that says there's no God. Okay? Or it's an infantile 